But will our philosophy not thus become a tragedy? Will truth not become inimical to life, to the better man? A question seems to lie heavily on our tongue, and yet refuses to be uttered. Whether one could consciously reside in untruth, or, if one were obliged to, whether death would not be preferable. For there is no longer any ought, for morality, in so far as it was an ought, has been just as much annihilated by our mode of thinking as has religion. Knowledge can allow as motives only pleasure and pain, utility and injury. But how will these motives come to terms with the sense for truth? For they too are in contact with errors, in so far as inclination and aversion and their very unjust assessments are, as we said, the essential determinants of pleasure and pain. The whole of human life is sunk deeply in untruth. The individual cannot draw it up out of this well without thereby growing profoundly disillusioned about his own past, without finding his present motives, such as that of honor, absurd, and pouring mockery and contempt on the passions which reach out to the future and promise happiness in it. Is it true? Is all that remains a mode of thought whose outcome on a personal level is despair, and on a theoretical level a philosophy of destruction? I believe that the nature of the after-effect of knowledge is determined by a man's temperament. In addition to the after-effect described, I could just as easily imagine a different one, quite possible in individual instances, by virtue of which a life could rise much simpler and emotionally cleaner than our present life is, so that, although the old motives of violent desire produced by inherited habit would still possess their strength, they would gradually grow weaker under the influence of purifying knowledge. In the end, one would live among men and with oneself as in nature, without praising, blaming, contending, gazing contentedly, as though at a spectacle, among many things for which one formerly felt only fear. One would be free of emphasis, and no longer prodded by the idea that one is only nature, or more than nature. For this to happen, one would, to be sure, have to possess the requisite temperament, as has already been said. A firm, mild, and at bottom cheerful soul. A temper that does not need to be on its guard against malice or sudden outbursts, and in whose utterances there is nothing of snarling and sullenness those familiar tedious qualities of old dogs and men who have long been kept on the leash. A man from whom the ordinary fetters of life have fallen to such an extent that he continues to live only so as to know better must, therefore, without envy or vexation, be able to forego much, indeed almost everything, upon which other men place value. That free, fearless hovering over men customs, laws, and the traditional evaluations of things must suffice him as the condition he considers most desirable. He is happy to communicate his joy in this condition, and he has, perhaps, nothing else to communicate, which involves, to be sure, one more privation and renunciation. If more is nonetheless desired of him, he will, with a benevolent shake of the head, point to his brother, the free man of action, and perhaps not conceal a certain mockery in doing so. For of his freedom there is a curious tale still to be told.